Thank you. Thank all of you. Let us begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So not far from here, there is a place uh, called the Alamo. And on a wall near the main entrance to the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas, is a portrait with the following inscription. James Butler Bonham, no picture of him exists. This portrait is of his nephew, Major James Bonham, deceased, who greatly resembled his uncle. It is placed here by the family that people may know the appearance of the man who died for freedom. Well, in this uh, we see the human concern for the picture of another image that conveys the portrayal of the original person. In a similar way, Jesus gave us another in the bread and the wine to portray him. A picture captures a sense of presence. We keep pictures of our loved ones with us for this reason. The image, image Jesus left, however, is more than a picture. He not only wanted to leave a portrayal of his person, he made it possible to communicate himself through the bread and the wine. And hence, they are not mere likenesses, they are the reality as Jesus declared when he said, Jesus took some bread and after a blessing said, this is my body, and when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave to them saying, this is my blood of the covenant. A very profound thought I want to leave you with. <laughs> If you don't get anything out of this lecture, this is it. Is means is. Okay. Christ's realist language about the specific objects of bread and wine have compelled the church of all ages to acknowledge that they are indeed what Jesus says his body and his blood in bread and wine. In one sense, all we can conclude is what the scriptures say. Uh, it would be good if that's all theologians did in the history of the church. Uh, we, we, we would not be in as much trouble as we are in now. Christ is in the Eucharist, a holy mystery affirmed, yet not fully comprehended, and there whether believed to be or not, though faith in Christ is required for the efficacy. The biblical word for sacrament is musterion. Uh, we get the word mystery from it. A mystery, a holy mystery in Scripture is true, real, objective. That is, it is reality apart from the subject. but not fully comprehended by human reason. All the great holy mysteries cannot be fully comprehended by human reason. So this little girl wrote Lewis Carroll, you know, lived, lived at, at, at Oxford, um, in Oxford, at, at Christ Church. And so uh, he wrote this poem about uh, the snark. So this little girl uh, writes and asks him why he would write a story, a poem about a creature, he would tell exactly what that creature is. And Carol's response was, it's hard to explain what you cannot understand. And when it comes to holy mystery, it is hard to explain what you cannot understand. But that doesn't negate the reality, whether it's the Doctrine of the Blessed Trinity, the Incarnation, and so on. Thus, biblical mystery is real, it is objective, but not able to be fully comprehended. While well, we can say what Jesus' language precludes, what it is not. It means more than real absence. <laughs> It means more than a mere symbol. So uh, I, I saw this ad. I owned one, I'm talking about this, this watch here. I owned one for a while, a very substantial watch with real presence. 
Well, that's not what we mean by real presence. Although the Eucharist does mysteriously attract. Holy mystery is luring, haunting, and attracting, and it is something that dogs you down, and you can't get away from it. Well, the is to be remembered is more than a fond memory. So uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, but you got these two people sitting in this weird hacked off back of a BMW in their living room. And it says the BMW 2002 living room marks the real presence of an icon in your home. <laughs> well, although the Eucharist has iconic character, it is more than memory. It conveys the reality of Christ to us. In fact, the anamnesis, the remembrance, do this in remembrance of me, if we could look at that in another, at another time, there is a background to that out of the Old Testament uh, that uh, conveys the anamnesis, the remembrance is objective. It's not just having a fond memory of Jesus. Is means reality that brings a face-to-face -face encounter, personal encounter with the living Christ. The Blessed Sacrament brings us face-to-face -face in a personal encounter with the living Jesus Christ, whether we believe it or not. So I um, saw this ad today. The corporation is launching Polycom Real Presence Mobile with its HD. And there are these people face to face. Well, the wonder of the Blessed Sacrament is, it's not just images on a screen. It's the reality of Jesus there, if is means is. And I believe it does. So the realist language of Jesus and the Holy Scriptures call us to believe and affirm the reality of Christ's presence under the forms of bread and wine. Number one, reality associated with the New Testament Greek word used for sign. We need to understand that when the New Testament refers to sign, it is not necessarily the same as our word that we use called symbol. It's a big mistake to assume that our vernacular means the same thing as similar words in the scriptures. Because in the ancient world, uh, when Jesus reference to the bread and the wine as this is my body, this is my blood, is not, it's not metaphorical as he sometimes used inanimate objects to refer to realities about himself. He's not speaking metaphorically. He did at times speak metaphorically. For example, Jesus spoke metaphorically this way in a general sense when he said, I am the door. Uh, I am the vine. Note he was not speaking of a particular door per se, or vine. We refer literally in English to this as a symbol. Symbols represent reality, but the reality is not necessarily participating in the particular image if it is a symbol as we commonly use that word. The Greek New Testament doesn't use the word sign that way. Instead, the Greek word translated as signs, maon, has a particular, particularity and a participatory nature to it. Jesus performed certain miracles he specifically called signs, not in the sense we use the word symbol of the miracle, for example, wedding at Cana. John writes, this beginning of signs, which is often translated miracles, but it's the Greek word for sign, Jesus did at Cana of Galilee. This is why you'll often hear me say, the greatest miracle past the resurrection, the greatest charismatic manifestation is what happens in the Blessed Sacrament. We may not think of it that way. But every time we celebrate the Eucharist, a great miracle takes place. Uh, in, in, in the true sense of the Greek word simeon, that sign, a true miracle. So a biblical sign 
is a miracle in which the reality participates in the image. Differentiated but not separable from it, such as when Jesus turned water into wine. Regarding the Eucharist, there's a specificity of a particular image. He wasn't talking about door in general. He was, he was talking about this bread, this wine. There's a particularity there. Do you see that? That's not the same as when he speaks metaphorically about a door or a vine or, or etc. Plus he also did other things when he said this is. He took it, he, he blessed it, he broke it. Okay, he didn't do that with the door and the vine. Scripture and the early church fathers referred to the Eucharist in the true sense of a sign as a miracle in which the reality participates in the image. The Eucharistic language of the New Testament where reality participates in the sign. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, is not the cup of blessing which we bless. And remember, this statement was what, you know, there were two great apologists for the Anglican way right after the time of the late 16th century, the 16th century uh, English Reformation. One was John Jewell, who had to answer uh, the Roman church from which the Church of England had left, the other one was Richard Hooker, who was the apologist dealing with the Puritans. Because quickly, when you have reforms, they tend to go to excesses. And then we spend another 200 years trying to clean it up. <laughs> so, you know, the Puritans wanted to get rid of wedding rings as a symbol. And their argument was you cannot bless an inanimate object. Richard Hooker said, wait a minute, I remember 1 Corinthians 10. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? And the Greek word they're sharing is participating in. Participating in. So St. Paul speaks of the cup and the bread as, let me give you some theological language that I, I believe we, we need to understand very, very, very desperately in the Western church. He speaks of numinous objects because something ontological happens to the bread and the wine. It's not just symbolic. And this is unlike anything else, unless it's tied to this, which is often why the other sacraments are always tied to it. Something ontological happens. That's the word. It comes, uh, 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 comes from the, the Greek word for being. Something happens to the essence. And the best word we can come up with in, in theology is ontological. It's more than just relational. Relational is good theological language. And this, in my humble opinion, this, this is an important issue in defending the Christian view of marriage. We're not just talking about movable parts in relationship with each other. That paints us into a corner. Because the, the, you know, the liberal left, they come along and say, we are right, we believe in relational theology. We believe in relationship. We just want to move the parts around a little bit. Well, why is that wrong? Because something ontological happens when any sacramental act is performed, including Christian marriage. That's the power of the living Christ being present uh, in the midst of a husband and wife, and most certainly with bread and wine. So they change in their essence while the material in some sense remains. This is the biblical and patristic sense of living sign. Therefore, when the early church fathers used the word sign or image, this is also important to understand, because while affirming the reality, they would also use language of sign and image in reference to the Blessed Sacrament. They did not mean 
the real presence of Christ to be mutually exclusive of this language. The sacrament is imaged precisely because Christ is the image of God who is really present. The New Testament says he is uh, the image of God. In fact, this was an argument used by St. John of Damascus. That the second commandment in the Old Testament that forbids worshiping graven images, St. John of Damascus' argument was, but Jesus Christ is the true image. You see that? So that when you worship Christ, where he is really present, you're not violating the second commandment. He, Jesus Christ, Colossians 1, 15. My brother got us off to a great start this morning in his exposition. It says, Paul says, He, Jesus Christ, is the image, the icon of the invisible God. His Son is the radiance of His glory, the very image of His substance. So, consistent with how this word sign is used in uh, the Greek New Testament, where the sign participates in the reality. C.S. Lewis, uh, in this uh, Paralandra Ransom, refers to the king of Paralanda, Paralandra as the live image of Maladil. He says, it was hard even for Ransom to tell me of the king's face where likeness was greatest, mistake was least possible, but here where there is his live image, like him within and without. And so when uh, the bread and the wine are consecrated, the true image of God is really present, who is Jesus Christ. Therefore, starting at his birth, Christ appears, not surprisingly, as the living bread you notice Christ was born. The text says, in a manger. What is a manger? A feeding trough. So one of my kids once said to me, gee, Dad, it's like God's trying to write it, spell it out for us with big Crayolas. <laughs> hint, hint. Jesus is born in the French manger. A feeding trough. Thus, not surprisingly, the realist language of John 6 comes to us. The Jews disputed, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? To me, their argument, their objection to what Jesus teaches in John 6 tells us everything. I mean, it becomes crystal clear after Jesus answers this as if it wasn't already clear. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Gosh, Kramer wasn't making that up after all, was he? Note well, the faith language of abiding explains the passages talking about uh, more than simply believing in Christ. Rather, the qualifier in the verse fits the context of belief in the Christ who is living bread of flesh and blood. Note he says, he who believes has eternal life, and then he adds in verse 47, I am the bread of life. The exchange with the Jews specifies Jesus is speaking of partaking of bread that is flesh and blood, which he clarifies at the Last Supper. In other words, he had ample opportunity in the exchange to qualify and say, oh, wait a minute, I'm not really talking about my flesh and blood. But it's as though he goes even further and deeper in the argument and says, this is precisely what I'm talking about. But it would not be fully understood, even by Christ's own followers, until the night our Lord was betrayed. 
4. Christ's real presence language at the Last Supper is similar to the marital language in the Garden of Eden. Notice on, the le on your left here, Adam's side was open from which Eve was made his body, rib. Christ's bride made from his side his blood flowed from the wound uh, administered to him on the cross. But notice the language of Adam in the garden after Eve is created. Part of him makes all of her. Part of him forms all of her. Theologically and really that's what happens. So he declares, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Similar language is used in 2 Samuel 5 verses 1 through 3 when King David renews the covenant with the people of Israel and he says, you are bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Jesus declared, this is my body of his bride. This is my body. And the bride partakes of his body and is formed out of him. We are formed by feeding upon the living Christ. And that becomes part of the great spirituality, the history of the church, and Eucharistic discipline and devotion. Partaking of Christ to become Christ. And so part of Adam was used to make all of Eve. Part of Christ is conveyed through the Eucharist to remake all of us. She became an image of him. We become an image of him in the true sense of the meaning of the Greek word for sign, which means to participate in the reality. Thus the realist language of the Gospels is clearly understood in the epistles, combined with the realist terminology throughout the New Testament, explains why from the earliest days of the church, it confessed that Christ is really present in the Eucharist, though a holy mystery. The early church fathers, Justin Martyr, he says, This food we call the Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake, except one who believes that the things we teach are true, and has received the washing for forgiveness of sins and for rebirth, and who lives as Christ handed down to us. For we do not receive these things as common bread or common drink, but as Jesus Christ our Savior, being incarnate by God's word, took flesh and blood for our salvation. So we also have been taught that the food consecrated by the word of prayer, which comes from him, from which our flesh and blood are nourished by transformation, there's that word, is the flesh and blood of that incarnate Jesus. St. Athanasius. You shall see the Levites bringing loaves and a cup of wine and placing them on the table. So long as the prayers of supplication and entreaties have not been made, there is only bread and wine. But after the great and wonderful prayers have been completed, then the bread is become the body and the wine the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, let us approach the celebration of the mysteries, this bread and this wine, so long as the prayers and supplications have not taken place, remain simply as they are. But after the great prayers and holy supplications have been sent forth, the word comes down into the bread and wine, and thus his body is confected. So immediately within the history of the church, it seems that they got what Jesus said that is means is. St. Cyril served as Bishop of Jerusalem in the years 348-378 A.D. He says, I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. 1 Corinthians 11.23 This teaching of the blessed Paul is alone sufficient to give you a full assurance concerning those divine mysteries which when ye are vouchsafed, ye are of the same body and blood with Christ. For he has just distinctly said, that our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, Take, drink, this is my blood. Since then he himself has declared and said of the bread, This is my body. Who shall dare to doubt any longer? 
And since he has affirmed and said, this is my blood, who shall ever hesitate saying that it is not his blood? Strong language. The highly respected Oxford scholar J.N.D. Kelly. Uh, you know, Kelly was the one that um, was asked to go with Michael Ramsey, Archbishop Michael Ramsey, on the historic visit to the Vatican to meet Pope Paul VI. J.N.D. Kelly was asked by the Archbishop of Canterbury to conduct him and put in charge of those historic dialogues that grew out of that. J.N.D. Kelly, in his early Christian doctrine, in the third century, the early Christian identification of the Eucharistic bread and wine with the Lord's body and blood continued unchanged, although a difference of approach can be detected. Focusing on the later doctrine of the Eucharist, Kelly adds, Eucharistic teaching, it should be understood at the outset, was in general unquestioningly realist. The consecrated bread and wine were taken to be and were treated and designated as the Savior's body and blood. The Oxford Movement scholar Darwar Stone corroborates Kelly's statements. Throughout the writings of the fathers, there is unbroken agreement that the consecrated bread and wine are the body and blood of Christ, and that the Eucharist is a sacrifice from his work, the Holy Communion. So, throughout the early church, it was affirmed what Jesus said of the Eucharist himself. Very simply understood, is means is. Let's turn our attention now to the Anglican divines and look at some of their own statements. But b beginning with uh, Archbishop Fisher, who said, the Anglican communion has no peculiar thought, practice, creed, or confession of its own. It has only the Catholic faith of the ancient Catholic Church as preserved in the Catholic creeds and maintained in the Catholic and Apostolic Constitution of Christ Church from the beginning. So the Anglican way is a perpetuation, to be understood as a perpetuation, of the faith once delivered, what we call the Catholic faith. The Anglican way, time again, draws upon and returns to the language of reality and mystery of Scripture and the undivided Church. It should be understood that in the 16th century reforms in the English church, the standard was to recover the undivided church. No doubt, as I've said, at times of reform there are excesses and meanderings and drifting away. But clearly, the standard was to recover the theology and the language of the undivided church. And through time, a number of Anglican divines articulate this and feed the church and help us to recover that ideal. May that be our ideal. So Nicholas Ridley, one of the Oxford martyrs, Bishop of Rochester, restores the Eucharistic language of the church fathers and just one sample. He says, I say and confess the bread which we break to be the communion and partaking of Christ's body with the ancient and faithful fathers. I say and believe that there is not only a signification of Christ's body set forth by the sacrament, but also that therewith is given to the godly and faithful the grace of Christ's body, that is, the food and life of immortality. And this I hold with Cyprian, I say also with St. Augustine that we eat life and we drink life, with Emocene that we feel the Lord to be present in grace, that with Athanasius that we receive celestial food which cometh from above, the property of natural communion, with Hilary the nature of flesh, and benediction which giveth life in bread and wine, with Cyril, and with the same Cyril, the virtue of the very flesh of Christ, life and grace of his body, the property of the only begotten, that is to say, life as he himself in plain words expounded it. And so on and so on and he goes. Notice what he's doing. He's quoting the church fathers. He's going back to the fathers because the 
the, the standard was to restore the undivided church. Richard Hooker uses uh, realist language when he says the bread and cup are his body and blood because they are causes instrumental upon receipt whereof the participation of his body and blood ensueth. And then he says every cause is in the effect which groweth from it. Moving on down so that his body and blood are in that very subject whereunto they minister life not only by effect or operation even as the influence of the heavens is in plants, beasts, and men and in everything which they quicken, but also by far more divine and a mystical kind of union which maketh us one with him as even as he and the Father are one. Bishop John Overall, moving now to the early 17th century, part of the King James Translation Committee, produced a commentary and notes on the Book of Common Prayer, Bishop of Coventry, he says, together with the hallowed elements of the bread and wine, we may receive the body and blood of Christ which are truly exhibited in this sacrament, the one as well as the other. And then he makes this statement in his notes on the Book of Common Prayer. The body and blood of Christ is really and substantially present. He goes on to say, in the sacrament of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper, the body and blood of Christ, and therefore the whole of Christ is verily indeed present. <clears throat> now, when he uses the word substantially, he means that, he uses that word in the sense of essence. So, just a brief excursus on the use of the word transubstantiation in theology because from the 13th century in the Western Church to the 16th century, that word was used two different ways because of the effect of a philosophy between the 13th century and the 16th century. And it's important to understand this because many Anglo-Catholics restored the use of the word transubstantiation, but in the, its original sense of the 13th century. So just a brief Note here, biblically speaking, substance means essence. His Son is the radiance of His glory, the very image of His substance. This is why the Anglican John Overall says of bread and wine is confessed by all divines that upon the words of the consecration, the body and blood of Christ is really and substantially present. Notice he says, it's confessed by all divines. And so exhibited and given to that, uh, to all that receive it and so forth. Christ is really substantially present such as that when Christ's host is broken uh, we, we don't believe that the bones of Jesus are, are physically broken when we break the host and yet it's acknowledged that he's substantially present there to honor what Jesus himself says of this. So many Anglo-Catholics return to the 13th century Thomas sense of transubstantiation, not to be confused with the later version of it that abandoned Thomism. So, Thomas Aquinas, brilliant theologian, didn't talk a lot and so they dubbed, they nicknamed him the dumb ox. But he was anything but dumb. So he uses Aristotle and Aristotle's form freedom distinction to develop incidence accidents language essence uh, material cup bread and so for Thomas he would acknowledge that the essence of the bread and the wine changed and Christ is really present, and you find this language, under the forms of bread and wine. So Thomas began to use Aristotle that way. Now, it's very interesting. 
and important to recognize that after Aquinas, there is a philosophy that comes to the Western Church called nominalism. It comes, it comes out of the scholastics. And if you understand what Thomas was saying, Christ is really present there under the form of bread and wine. Nominalism, taking Aristotle and his philosophy a bit further, argued that the matter is the thing itself. The matter. And with that shift in understanding transubstantiation, superstition, um, certain liturgical practices be began to happen um, that affected the Western Church. And a Anglican theologians rightfully reacted to what was happening in theology by applying Aristotle to it, which led to nominalism. It's very significant that a movement took place in the last century in the Roman Catholic Church in France called the Nouvelle Theology Movement that actually confirms uh, what, what I've been saying. Um, the Nouvelle Theologians, um, also called resourcement for a desire to return to the scriptures and the church fathers to get behind the emergence of what they call secular theology movements beginning with the use of Aristotle's categories for theology. Uh, there are two sides or streams expressed in rival journals. Communio Henri de Lubac, Louis Bouillet, Jean Danielou, Hans Urs von Balthasar, Joseph Ratzinger. All of this resourcement, nouveau theology movement, uh, beginning in France in the early to mid 1900s. The Concilium, on the other side, the left side, Karl Rahner, Yves Conger, Edward Skillebex, Hans Kuhn, Marie Dominique Chanou. So, what the, these Roman Catholic Nouvelle theologians begin to argue is that secularism began in the Western Church when its theologians started using Aristotle and taking Aristotle's view of matter. Because under the influence of Aristotle, Matter is matter, and it has no involvement in God. There is the material world, and there is the supernatural world, but the material world has nothing to do with God, inherently. And so the Nouvelle Theologian said, you know, you can't blame it all on the Reformers. And in fact, they said, actually, we don't necessarily agree with their conclusions, but, but, but they were on to something when they make statements that they don't like Aristotle and what he's doing to theology. Because up to Aquinas, and the Nouvelle theologians say that uh, Aquinas was kind of a watershed. He was kind of a combination be, uh, uh, of Plato and Aristotle. Because prior to, Ar prior to Aquinas, uh, Plato... Uh, w was used. It was kind of a Christian Platonism. Uh, Hans Borsma, who has the, the chair, the J.I. Packer Chair of Theology at Regent College, I mean, he is sort of the scholar on the Nouvelle Theologian movement. Phenomenal scholar. And if you've not read his book, Heavenly Participation, Heavenly Participation uh, Weaving a Sacramental Tapestry, I highly recommend it. Because prior to the use of Aristotle, the physical world, all of the physical world, was viewed as participating in the other world. Now that's very Celtic. You've seen a Celtic knot, right? You know, the interweaving. And the theological view behind that is heaven and earth are woven into each other. You, you listen to the desert fathers, the Celtic monks, I mean, they speak of these incredible things happening where heaven appears right there. 
uh, the, the other world opens up and they talk to saints and they, they get to look into that world, which by the way, there are some, we see some examples even in the Holy Scriptures of the other world opening up right there. So in other words, they didn't believe, the ancients didn't believe that, that heaven as we know it was up there. They didn't believe that. They believe that heaven is right there. And the Nouvelle theologians, therefore, I, I think, are on to something. That's why this, this thing we call secularism, it is so monstrous and virile and it runs so deeply in, in Western culture. And it begins with this notion that matter is neutral, that matter is not participating in the other world. It's a very different way of looking at the physical world, which I think is a, a true creationist perspective on the natural world. In fact, all the natural world is in some sense supernatural. Distinguished from God, but yet somehow participating in the other world. So, most medieval Reformation, post-Reformation Anglicans returned to the language of the undivided church. And you can see the strength of doing that, returning to the undivided church. And I would just say, you know, ecumenically, this is what I'm hearing across the board. In fact, even specifically, what I'm hearing across the board is Orthodox, Roman Catholic, Anglicans, let's return to the scriptures and the church fathers. We must go back to there. The Nouvelle Theologians, not surprisingly, um, Jean Daniel Lou, he talks about, you know, the liturgy and the Bible. Uh, tremendous Bible teachers. And in one sense, they begin to drive restoring Bible teaching in the Roman church. And in that sense, have a great influence on Vatican II. So, excursus over. What happens with Anglo-Catholics and their desire to get back to the ancient church, the movement we call the Oxford Movement in the 19th century, is they, some of them begin to use the word transubstantiation in the true Thomistic sense. That's not really undivided church language, in all fairness. Our brothers and sisters in the East, for example, don't use that kind of language because the, the word for sacrament, you know, in the undivided church is mystery. Mysterion. Okay. So what I'm saying is, we in the Anglican way, uh, this quest to get back to the undivided church is on solid footing. So... The undivided church approach by post-Reformation Anglicans, Lancelot Andrews, a famous bishop. He chaired the committee on uh, the King James Bible translation. He knew 15 languages. Uh, loved the Eastern Church Fathers. Very interesting man. Had icons in his chapel. Served under Elizabeth I, James I, and Charles I. He was an extraordinary man. <laughs> so he says, um, he has this debate with a, a cardinal named Bellarmine. And he says, of the mode of the presence we define nothing rationally, nor I add, do we curiously inquire no more than how the blood of Christ cleanses us in our baptism. No more than how in the incarnation of Christ the human nature is united into the same person with the divine. We rank it among mysteries. There's that word. Why is Lancelot Andrews using the word mystery? That's the language of the undivided church. And indeed, the Eucharist itself is a mystery. And that which remaineth ought to be burnt with the fire and so forth. He's talking about uh, a reference there uh, to 
what if you leave the, the manna, you know, from the miracles in the Old Testament of the manna, uh, they were supposed to consume it, um, but not keep it around. He says, that is, as the fathers elegantly express it to be adored by faith, not examined by reason. That's a shot against nominalism, the scholastics, and the Western church. John Donne, priest, poet, satirist, theologian, Dean of St. Paul's, 1621. He says, But yet though this bread be not transubstantiated, and now you know what sense he's referring to that in the, the altered redefinition of transubstantiation after nominalism has done a number on that, done a number on Aquinas. We refuse not the words of the fathers of which they have expressed themselves in this mystery. And there again, John Donne. And so I'm, I'm moving through the centuries to show you the continuity. Not Irenaeus has est corpus, that the bread is his body now, not Tertullian feci corpus, that that bread has made his body which was not so before, not St. Cyprian's mutatus, that that bread is changed, not Damascene supernaturaliter mutatus, that that bread is not only changed so in the use, as when at the king's table certain portions of bread are made bread of essay to pass over every dish, whether for safety or for majesty. No, not only so civilly changed, but changed supernaturally. No, nor Theophylax transformatus est, which seems to be the word that goes farthest of all, for this transforming cannot be intended of the outward form and fashion, for that is not changed, but be it of that internal form, which is the very essence, the nature of the bread, so it is transformed, so the bread hath received a new form, a new essence, a new nature, because whereas the nature of bread is not to nourish the body, the nature of his bread now is to nourish the soul. And therefore... And he gives the Latin quote, this is my body, and so on. Bishop John Cousin, Bishop of Durham, we move now to the end of the 17th century, and we're approaching uh, the 18th century. He says, we confess with the fathers that this manner of presence is unaccountable and past finding out, not to be searched and pried into by reason, but believed by faith. And if it seems impossible that the flesh of Christ should descend and come to be our food through so great a distance, we must remember how much the power of the Holy Spirit exceeds our sense and our apprehensions, and how absurd it would be to undertake to measure his immensity by our weakness and narrow capacity, and so make our faith to conceive and believe what our reason cannot comprehend. Yet our faith does not cause or make that presence. Critical statement here. The faith doesn't make the presence. But apprehends it as most truly and really affected by the word of Christ and the faith whereby we are said to eat the flesh of Christ is not only that, that only whereby we believe that he died for our sins, for this faith is required and supposed to precede the sacral education, but more properly that whereby we believe those words of Christ, this is my body. Thomas Kinn, non-juror, these were the, those who couldn't take the oath to William and Mary uh, when they became monarchs of England. And the Archbishop of Canterbury, six bishops, and many, many clergy left, and uh, they were unseated. Wrote the famous hymn, Awake My Soul. He says, I believe, O crucified Lord, that the bread which we break in the celebration of the holy mysteries is the communication of thy body, and the cup of blessing which we bless is the communication of thy blood, that thou dost as effectually and really convey thy body and blood to our souls by the bread and wine, as thou didst thy Holy Spirit by the breath, thy breath to thy disciples, for which all love, all glory be to thee. Lord, what need I labor in vain to search out the manner of thy mysterious presence in the sacrament? When my lobe assures me thou art there, all the faithful who approach thee with prepared hearts, they well know thou art there. They feel the virtue of thy divine love going out of thee to heal their infirmities and to inflame their affections for which all love, all glory be to thee. 
O God incarnate, how can, thou canst give us thy flesh to eat and thy blood to drink. How thy flesh is meat indeed, how thou who art in heaven art present on the altar, I can by no means explain, but I firmly believe it all because thou hast said it, and I firmly rely on thy love and on thy omnipotence to make thy word good thy word, though the manner of doing it I cannot comprehend. Is means is. Now we come into the 19th century. Famous statement by, made by James DeCoven, priest, professor at Neshota House, 1874 General Convention. Notice the language he uses. He says, the spiritual presence of the body and blood of our Lord in the Holy Communion is objective and real. Quick comment about the word spiritual. The ancient church fathers used spiritual in reference to real presence in a pre-enlightenment sense to mean incarnational, not ethereal. And it's very important that we, again, not read post-enlightenment understandings of terms and spiritual is a real weasel word. Now that's what the theologians say. See? I mean, you know, it's, it's new agey because spiritual means ethereal, the force is with you. Okay. It's become a big weasel word. But look, take your concordance and look up the word spiritual in the New Testament. Do you know where it's, what chapter in the Bible it's used more than any other chapter in the New Testament? 1 Corinthians 15 referring to the resurrected body of Jesus. The resurrected body of Jesus is called a spiritual body in the sense of glorified, transformed by the power of God. It's not ethereal. It's not ghost. Okay. And that was the pre-enlightenment understanding of the word spiritual. So, Theodore in the ancient church, he sets forth the doctrine of the real present using the language of transformed and spiritual. He says... At first, it is laid upon the altar as mere bread and wine mixed with water. But by the coming of the Holy Spirit, it is transformed into the body and blood, and thus it is changed into the power of a spiritual and immortal nourishment. Now, he's not using the word spiritual there in some ethereal sense. And so, as we come to an end... I love this statement by James DeCoven, General Convention, 1874. He says, You may take away from us, if you will, every eternal ceremony. You may take away altars and super altars, lights and incense, investments, and we will submit to you, but gentlemen, to adore Christ's person in his sacrament, that is the inalienable privilege of every Christian and Catholic heart. How we do it, the way we do it, the ceremonies with which we do it are utterly, utterly indifferent. The thing itself is what we plead for. So I'll conclude with this. I'm here today as the grace of God worked in my life as a, a teenager struggling because I had a mother that would not shut up about the gospel. <laughs> and in my troubled teenage years there was a church down the street from our house that had a chapel. And in this chapel they had reserved sacrament and they had a practice. I mean, imagine that. You could leave churches open in those days. But they would leave the Blessed Sacrament out on the altar. And in my troubled years, I didn't know much, but something told me. I now know what it was. It was the Holy Spirit. I, I would walk past this church and I would swear I wasn't going to go into it, and I would end up in that chapel in front of that altar. Now, I didn't know much, but I would sit there and I would, I would look 
at the Blessed Sacrament. And I got to tell you, the Holy Spirit worked. The Holy Spirit worked. And that became a place through my teenage years where I would go when I have a fight with my father. We couldn't pay our bills. And I would sit there. All I can tell you is the Lord God worked. And thus one of my favorite hymns is, O God unseen yet ever near, by Edward Osler. O God unseen yet ever near, thy presence may we feel, and thus inspired with holy fear before thine altar kneel. Here may thy faithful people know the blessings of thy love, the streams that through the desert flow, the manna from above. We come obedient to thy word to feast on heavenly food. Our meat the body of the Lord, our drink his precious blood. Thus may we all thy word obey, for we, O God, are thine, and go rejoicing on our way, renewed with strength divine. Amen. Amen. Thank you.